This is a thunder hammer, but it could use a little more power? That's more like it. This is cool and all, but what if we made it bigger? This entire project was designed in CAD and 3D printed, minus a few parts that add structural integrity to the project. And speaking of designs, I actually make all of these myself from a simple 2D reference or something online. If I get to 5,000 subscribers or 10,000 views on this video, I'll make all these design files free for everybody to download. Check the description for more details. After everything was 3D printed, I ran into some issues that you'll usually have with a 3D printer, and that is layer lines. I've made a lot of functional props over the last couple of years, and I've been looking for a process that was cheap, easy, and quick to dry. Honestly, there's no simple solution, but this is what I did. To achieve this metallic look, I use these materials. Sandpaper is integral to this project, so you're going to want to pick up a variety of grits. You're also going to need a variety of metallic paints, as well as primers and clear coat. To get rid of the layer lines, you're going to need UV resin and a UV curing light. I started by sanding all of my parts with 220 grit. Then I applied some primer just to know where the imperfections in the parts were. I then poured out some UV resin and brushed it onto the surface of the part until all of those crevices were filled. This seemed to work pretty well in my test sample, so I went ahead and did this to all of my parts. However, once I finished, some of the parts were really sticky or tacky on the surface and I didn't really know what happened. But there is a way to fix this. After some research, I found that the oxygen in the air was actually preventing the photopolymerization of the top layer of resin. So there's only one answer to this. Get rid of all the oxygen. Okay, okay, there's an easier way to do this. Just take your part, submerge it in some water, take your UV lamp, and cure the top layer that way. At this point, it should be far less sticky or not sticky at all. If it still is, don't worry, you can hit it with some sandpaper to get rid of that stickiness. Or if worse comes to worse, sand it all off and start again from the ground layer. Once I was happy with the smoothness of the part, I moved on to painting. This involves starting with primers, noticing the defects, sanding them down, and then priming more to build that ground layer up to something suitable to paint with the metallic paints. However, my process this time around was a little bit different. I used this conductive paint which allowed me to arc the Tesla coil discharge back into the hammer itself. Which made it closer to the final effect I was going for. On screen now is a reference that I used to paint the hammer. They were all numbered so that I could recall which one I needed to use for what part. In general, my painting process involves spraying one coat and then waiting 50 minutes, then spraying another coat, and then letting it cure for a full day. A common mistake that I make is trying to rush through the paint job by painting too much in one go or by painting too often. Honestly, don't do this. It's just a waste of time. It's going to leave cracking and it's going to be ugly and you're going to have to start over. And my advice is that it's going to take you a day to sand everything down, another day to prime everything, another day to paint your metal coat. So honestly, you're wasting five times as much time as just waiting. When painting, you'll also come across pieces that you're going to need to mask off. Oftentimes, you'll get bleed paint under the tape itself. So the way I fix this is by getting some clear coat and spray painting the area that I want to do really quick, letting that cure, and then spray painting my final metal coat on top of that. I mean, honestly, look at these results. Look at how crisp those lines are on this lightning bolt. Good soup. Okay, so all the metal paint was applied. I let it cure for another day, and then I applied another layer of matte clear coat over everything. This prepared the part for weathering. And yes, you wanna clear coat the part first, then weather it, let that dry, and then clear coat again. Trust me. For the weathering itself, I used two shades of oil-based paint. One was black, and one was a burnt umber color. Basically, this is a trust the process type of thing. You're just gonna take your paint, you're gonna brush it all over the surface and really jam it into those crevices. And then you're gonna wipe it off with some paper towel. As you're going through the process, the paper towel will get saturated with paint. When you're ready to do your final wipe down, I would suggest getting a clean piece of paper towel and then finishing it off that way. And you can repeat this process as many times as you want with as many different colors as you want to really get that aged metal look. And just to show you the difference, here's the after and here's the before. 
I then repeated the process with the rest of the parts and threw in some of that burnt umber just to give it some more organic rust feel to it. You can also use acrylic paints, but when I used them, I found that the parts and the weathering wasn't as pronounced and it just took longer. So that's why I prefer oil paints. After giving the weathering ample amount of time to dry, I clear coated everything again and we were ready to go. Guess it's just time to assemble it now. This hammer was designed to use a two inch PVC pipe that was 70 centimeters in length, as well as a quarter inch rod that was cut to 116 centimeters in length. Wow, the way I uh, used units there couldn't be more Canadian, eh? Anyway, these are the main rigid supports of the entire hammer as the hammer heads with all the Tesla coils in them got really heavy. All right, 10 pounds isn't that heavy, but it's, it's pretty heavy. Basically, everything was assembled together with an ample amount of PL construction adhesive. I use this in most of my projects. And all these pieces were designed with enough tolerance to just kind of slide in together, which made my job pretty easy for the most part. And you gotta do that one last sanity check to make sure everything is plumb and square before the glue actually sets, you know? I like to use real metal screws at my 3D printed projects. And these threaded inserts add that functionality. Simply grab them with some pliers, place them where you want them to go, bring your soldering iron, heat that sucker up, and then discard of the sample piece because you didn't make the holes the right size, and then add your actual final piece to it. As simple as that. To get power to the Tesla coils, I needed 48 volts, which meant two 6S batteries in series with a switch in between. The real problem here wasn't the power system, but rather the Tesla boxes fitting into the hammer heads, which I designed to fit everything perfectly. But lo and behold, nothing works as expected. So with some elbow grease, I eventually got them into position, never to be taken out again. Then it was a matter of just taking those wires from the battery and soldering them to the Tesla coils. A quick test to ensure everything works. And quick assembly of the other side before gluing everything down. Oh, and of course we need to add the needles to ensure that we actually get an arc. The sharp point was important, but I didn't really see an issue with different lengths. So I ended up cutting some down to size just so that they wouldn't be as prominent on the overall device and could easily arc back to that conductive paint that I mentioned earlier. Also, what was nice about these devices is that these spikes could screw in as well as screw out. So if I ever needed to convert it to just another cosplay prop, I could easily do so. And for the final touch, I added some burgundy vinyl material that I found at my local art store to the handle. I think this turned out pretty good and it was a pretty good find on my part. Now with everything together, I did a quick lift test and uh, everything worked pretty well. But I did hear a little cracking noise. And on closer inspection, it looks like this was the culprit. So I 3D modeled and printed a little collar that could reinforce this area. It had wire going through it so that it was extra sturdy. And of course, I applied ample amounts of PL before sticking this thing down. Quick paint job and we're off to the races. This thing is awesome and the bench test confirms that. The effect does work best in low light though. Yo dog, I heard you like electric hammer, so I put an electric hammer on your electric hammer. File download in the description below. Now for the real test. Can this be wielded while the Tesla coils are on? Of course it can. What do you think? I didn't do my research. These coils are mostly harmless. As long as you keep your fingers moving so that it doesn't burn one spot, you're good. But oh man, does this thing ever look good in the dark? And can you imagine being an intruder and you just see this turn on in the distance? 
not just the lightning, but uh, I think the noise is pretty scary. It's, uh, it's about this on the dB scale, if I had to guess. This is one of my favorite functional props so far. Well, at least those that can be wielded. Click here if you want to watch me make an eight foot sword that shoots real fire. Speaking of fire, a question that nobody had on their mind, can this light fires? For more crazy builds like this, make sure to subscribe. I have a lot of cool projects stacked for the next year, so you're gonna wanna make sure to stick around for that. Let's grow this channel together so I can truly make some of these crazy ideas that I have in my backlog. As always, I've been your captain and I hope you enjoyed your journey.